Hi, Anthony. Hey, Frank. How are you? I'm good. Uh, g- uh, amazing seeing you again. If it's just um, you know throughout uh, through a screen, um, yes. And um, last time we I, I'm, I'm, we discussed, you know, we talked about this just now. But I think last time we saw each other in, in the flesh was more than eleven years ago now, nearly twelve years ago now, which sounds bonkers. Ridiculous. But you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At this uh, at this event in Soas, where we were launching your your book with um, uh, Ahmed Moor, right? Ahmed Moor, uh, Palestinian uh, after Zionism. Yeah, after yeah. Zionism. So yeah, amazing. Um, uh, I, I guess we could also talk about after Zionism because you know what's happening now might be relevant to that. But uh, right now, we wanna. I want you to focus on on this new book of yours that I have here. Um, the Palestine ah, Laboratory. This is an advanced copy, I think I got. And yes. uh, interesting enough, I realized today that it says here 20, May 23rd, which is my birthday. So I was like, oh, ah. look. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, done. Um, yeah. well, it came out. Yeah. It came out before October 7. But yeah. um, the book, yeah, we can talk about this. The book came out before then. But since mm. October, it was doing quite well. And then October 7 happened. And it's kind of. Yeah exploited in a way it's been quite overwhelming in many yeah. ways but anyway to be discussed yes yeah and congratulations by the way because the book won the uh, people's choice award at the 2024 victorian premier literary yeah. awards which is amazing thank you thank you frank yeah i mean it's, it's amazing yeah yeah it's amazing also because it's a book about palestine you know so it's, it's great that these books uh, can win awards and be you know, made more uh, more visible to a lot of people. Yes. But anyway, enough of this very long intro. Um, it's I've, I've I mean I've started reading it, and you know you make notes and stuff because you know I make notes anyway, and I want you yeah. to interview you. But then after like what five pages, I'm like, God, you know, Israel is portrayed as this beacon of democracy in the Middle East surrounded by enemy states dictatorships and stuff but then you read honestly like what 10 15 pages and you realize that historically israel has been i mean since since its birth really in 1948 israel in its weapons industry have been in fact supporting the most brutal dictatorships around the world for the last 70 years can you tell can you tell me a bit more about that This is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book, actually, that, you know, for many, at least on the left, there's a knowledge of sorts about US foreign policy since 1945, involvement in dictatorships, supporting brutal regimes from Iran under the Shah to Pinochet. That history is known of sorts. What is much less known is, frankly, the Israeli involvement in all those regimes and more. Now, the US is a superpower and arguably Israel is not, doesn't have quite the same uh, power. However, the book is, as you say, at least initially, the book is not a historical work. I mean, it's, history, of course, is part of it. Essentially, examining how pretty much since Israel's birth, from its early leaders, from Ben Gurion onwards, there was a real understanding that for new nations, they needed to make friends. And the way they defined that was developing, selling, testing new weapons on Palestinians, even before 1967 which could then be promoted and marketed as battle-tested to a global market. And obviously this was being done in a range of ways before 1967. As people will be aware, between 48 and 67, Palestinians, of course, were not given equal rights. It's always been a colonial country, a colonial state. They're under martial law of sorts for those 20-odd years. And even then Israel was already testing forms of control how to so-called manage people. 67 happens, the occupation happens, and here we are 50-plus years onwards. And pretty much from the beginning, Israel was determined to firstly challenge what was some opposition in some parts of the world to what Israel was doing, those who claimed correctly it was essentially a colonial project, but secondly, to try to advertise their skills to nations that might want it. Now, when I say skills, skills of so-called repressing Indigenous populations or 
um, the way, you know, the newest kinds of weapons, whatever it may be. So I document in the book everything from uh, Chile under Pinochet to the genocidal regime in Guatemala in the 80s to the Iranian Shah before 1979 to in the modern era, it's almost easier to look at nations that have not <laughs> bought Israeli repressive tech. And as finally, the book doesn't show that Israel's whole reason to exist is solely to sell weapons. It's not. Or for that matter, I would argue that what they're doing in Gaza now is not simply to sell weapons. However, it's been a key part of its history and a key way, frankly, it's made a lot of friends and kept those friends. It's a history which is very, I would say, largely secret. Yeah, and um, I, when I read your book, I, I don't know why, this song kept, kept popping into my head, you know, by um, uh, Tom Jones, you know. Uh, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing, nothing. <laughs> you know. But actually, this couldn't be, like, more wrong, right? Exactly. <laughs> war is very good and very profitable very for a lot of people. Lot and of actually... People. While preparing the interview, I was like, man, like it's this uh, former uh, guy from the NSO group, which is behind the Pegasus software, yes. uh, spyware, um, posted, I don't know if you saw that in The Intercept, he posted a video from Gaza because oh, he's, yes. he's a reservist announcing yes. his new million dollars venture. So again, yeah. like war is very good for a lot of people, right? Hugely. I mean, this work in some ways comes out of my former book and film on disaster capitalism, which came out about 10 years ago. And that wasn't about Israel-Palestine at all. It was about Afghanistan and other places like that, people making money from misery, essentially. And the impact of what Israel is doing, the book this came out of this idea that there was all that coverage of Pegasus in the last six or seven years, and there was some good media in some Western press about all these nations that had bought Pegasus and those repressive states were essentially spying on their own citizens. But what was missing from so much of the Western media coverage was that this wasn't some rogue Israeli company, NSO Group. It was essentially an arm of the state that like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon in the US, yes, they're private companies in name, they have a board and they have shareholders, sure, but essentially they are used by Washington, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine as a key part of their foreign policy. Israel is exactly the same. So for years and years and years, the industry used to be public and it's now predominantly private, but that's only private in name. So all these companies, Elbert being the most infamous essentially is used by the Israeli state to make friends. And a few examples, so as one example, which I talk about in the book, on the US-Mexico border, which obviously has been a contested space for a very, very long time, there are Israeli surveillance towers made by Elbert across the entire area. And this was started by Obama. It continued with Trump, and it's definitely finished um, by Biden. And the reason I mention that is that the U.S. is not doing awful policies on the U.S.-Mexico border because of Israel. They're doing it for their own domestic, awful, racist reasons. But the reason the U.S. wanted to buy that technology was it had been tested first in Palestine. Those Elba towers have been used in the past and still today across Palestine, including some of those towers, by the way, on the Israel-Gaza border, which failed for Israel's perspective on October 7th. So you see all these examples around the world of Israeli surveillance technology or weapons, and the only reason they're bought by those other states is that they've been battle-tested in Palestine first. That's the appeal to these nations. So as I say in the book, the occupation of Palestine is not staying there. It's essentially being exported globally, and that to me is a concern because it's bad enough for Palestinians in Palestine, of course. But you see all these examples and I show in the book briefly that there's at least 125, 30, 40 countries, so the majority of nations on the planet, that have bought some form of Israeli repressive technology or weapons. That's, I mean, it's astounding. And that history is mostly unknown, even to this day. 
And uh, I mean, in a way, it's a, it's a state. You know, we live in a state, um, in a state, in a, in an era of of permanent war, right? Um, anyway, the, the major powers around, if, if you look at the last, whatever, 50, 60, there's always a war going on. Uh, and I think you've just explained yes. why, you know, um, uh, yes. it's, it's, I mean, the arms, the weapons industry, and I mean, a, a common friend, I'm sure you know, Andrew, Andrew Feinstein. I has also, He's in the book, he's an amazing, amazing guy, yeah. Yeah, has also worked very, very closely on, on studying that. Um, yeah, war is it's just a very profitable business. And and this, you know, because a lot of, you know, I've got kids and they ask me, you know, kids ask the, the hardest questions sometimes, you know. But dad, why? Why would why would they just fight? Why why would there be this war right now? I mean, there's other explanations, of course, but business yeah. is a is a very strong one. It's a key um, factor. I don't yeah. think it's the only one. It's not the only reason that the, yeah. US, the US didn't go to war in Iraq because of Lockheed Martin, for example, yeah. no. Um, Israel's not fighting in Gaza because of Elbert, no. But what, I show, what I've been doing a lot of work on in the last five months since October 7 is that Israel is currently live testing weapons in Gaza through a variety of ways, and they're promoting that on social media. And that is not just for a domestic Israeli audience to try to convince them that they're winning the war. We obviously can argue about that clearly, but it's for a global market. It's to say to other countries, look what we're doing in Gaza. And as I often say to people, look what a nation set does, not what it says. All the Arab states, basically every single one, no one's cut ties with Israel since October 7, and I can guarantee you nobody will. I'm not talking about the Arab people, of course, the Arab governments, who are, yes, they complain that what's happening in Gaza is terrible and Israel should stop the war, and they may think that, but that's for domestic concerns. They know that their people don't like Israel. But ultimately, UAE, Bahrain, Saudi, Morocco have all been buying huge amounts of weapons and surveillance tech from Israel for years, and they have every intention of continuing to buy that because they fear almost the repeat of the Arab Spring. They fear their own people. They fear their own people rising up. And the Arab Spring was such an existential crisis. I mean, the Arab Spring, you could argue, collapsed a variety of different ways. But the idea of people rising up, they want to get the best repressive tech in the world to stop their own people rising up. And where's that come from? Israel. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is something that is so... Um frustrating when you when you hear all these arab leaders or or others you know um saying that you know israel should stop i mean one example for me is is turkey you know erdogan is always very good at saying you know netanyahu is a genocidal maniac but then i think i don't want to get this wrong i was looking into it but turkey is one of the fourth largest recipient of like i think also exporter to to israel so that they are and and you know when countries like even more so now the us the uk france say like you know if only we could stop it we would we would they could like tomorrow yes, they could yeah i mean the us obviously is the key player yeah. i mean this is why as a journalist i've been so exasperated with so much of the media coverage as i'm sure many viewers of this um video would be but i mean in terms of the amount of focus that Every single breath that Biden says last week, I'm very concerned that what Israel's doing in Gaza is over the top. Okay, firstly, I don't even know what that means. Secondly, it's almost like he's it's like some guy, random guy at the pub saying that. It's like, mate, you're the president of America. You could stop this. You could stop sending weapons. As an example, this week, there is a massive new bill in Congress, which may or may not fully pass. We don't know. But Huge amounts of more money to Israel, including weapons. This is what matters. And that's the case with much of the West. I mean, one example, Germany, which obviously I talk about in the book, and I'm also a, I'm an Australian citizen, but I'm also a German citizen. And Germany's obviously history in the 20th century is self-evidently horrific. But Germany has become, as some viewers will be aware, some of the most fanatical pro-Israel so-called supporters in the world to the point where since October 7, they have rushed massive amounts of weapons to Israel, along with 
trying to criminalise dissent, um, physically attacking the police, have been attacking pro-Palestine and pro um, and Jewish and Palestinian supporters in the last months and before that, trying to criminalise BDS in this deluded way that they feel like the way that we atone for the Holocaust somehow is to show complete solidarity with Israel, which to me is so counterproductive because as I often say, what Israel is doing is making all of us, including me as a Jew, much more unsafe, so much more unsafe, long before October 7, but certainly since October 7. There's just no doubt about that. Um, so, yeah, the arms industry is, again, not the only reason wars happen, but they are a major reason. And so often the Western press either ignores that, plays it down, or just as one final, final example, the US media, CNN, MSNBC, regularly has analysts and commentators talking about war, former generals, etc. What they never say is the majority of them are on the boards of these defence companies. So when they sort of say, you know, Biden needs to really strike Iraq or strike Syria, you think a journalist would say, hang on a minute, do you have self-interest in saying that? They don't. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I want you to talk about something else as well. Um, maybe, you know, the broader Palestine question. I um, I saw an interview with you on Democracy Now!, which was before October, it was June 2023. And you talked about politicide, uh, a term coined by uh, Baruch Kimmeling. Um, and, and it's very interesting because when we, you know, I was part of the coordinating team of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, when yes. we had a, our session in New York, which was, I think, in 2012, we, we, you know, we had an organizing committee and we were like, what's going to be the focus of this meeting? Uh, what are we going to look at? You know, um, and uh, a lot of people were like, we should actually ask the question about genocide. So we had a lot of argument about this and, and we decided that maybe genocide was like pushing it a bit, like to keep it simple. And, and we focused on sociocide. Then I'm seeing your interview talking about politicide. But then from June till February, history has accelerated tenfold, right? And now the word genocide is, is, is actually being talked about. Uh, when it comes to, yeah. to Israel Palestine, so I want you to comment on that. But and I, I've asked this to a few people, including Jeff Alper. Do you think, in a way, for someone like you that has studied the, the, this period, for, from this period, and this you know a question for many years, that in a way, potentially genocide had to be the last stage of Zionism? If you know what I mean. You're asking all the big questions. Let me let me let me answer, answer the first bit first, just to briefly explain what politicide is to people. Politicide is a term that basically means an attempt to try to extinguish a people's identity, which is not necessarily through death. It might be trying to curtail their ability to organise, to speak out. Their freedom of speech is curtailed. It could, it could also be in killing as well. And what Kimmeling was talking about. Is in, he was talking about in the in the um, period of um, Ari, um, Ariel Sharon, the former and now deceased war criminal ex Israeli prime minister, who had a key plan for years to try to extinguish, I use that term advisedly, as many Palestinians as possible, not necessarily killing every single one, but making their political aims completely impossible. And, you know, the end of my book, I talk about, I mean, obviously I didn't predict October 7, no one particularly did, but I talk about the fear that I had and others had too of some major event, a, a war, a strike, a terrorist attack, something that would therefore trigger, in inverted commas, the justification within Israel to commit mass crimes. I didn't use the word genocide then, I don't think, but and I think October 7 was that event, clearly. The question of whether it's inevitable 
that the only way Zionism can survive long term, I use the term survive long term, is to commit genocide or mass killing or mass removal of people. I think the answer is probably yes to that. Not necessarily killing 5 million Palestinians. I don't think the aim of Israel right now is to kill every single Gazan. I don't think that's the aim. That's not to excuse Israel, of course. But if Israel, as they have done, has made Gaza literally uninhabitable, what are, including many friends of mine, I'm sure many friends of yours, friends, I'm sure, of people who are watching this video, what are they supposed to do, including Palestinians who said, we will never leave. We don't care how bad it gets. We're not going to leave our land. And now, I'm not saying all, of course, but many are saying totally reasonably, not all, not all, but many reasonably are saying, what, what, what are we supposed to do? I mean, we, we, we'd like to leave, not because they're dying to leave Palestine, because there's, not, there's no life there. And what I fear is, as someone who is Jewish but not religious, atheist really, but I often talk about, the book doesn't focus on this a lot, but I speak about it elsewhere. I try to deal with the complicity of my own community, not just what's happening since October 7, but we have got to this moment now where, yes, there are critical Jewish voices. Of course, there are Jewish voices for peace and others. Obviously, they're not the only one, clearly. But the fact is, the vast bulk of the organized Jewish community in most Western countries are 110% behind Israel. That's the sad reality. That is the moral collapse of my so-called my community. And as I say in the book, I'm sort of quoting myself, but I'm paraphrasing, there's been a weaponization of Jewish trauma in the service of mass crimes. I was talking about occupation in the book, but it could be genocide too. And it's that weaponization of trauma. There is Jewish trauma. My family was often killed, most of all killed in the Holocaust. That trauma is there. I'm not denying that. But it's manifested itself in the 20th and 21st centuries in this horrendous, militarized, hyper-nationalized, racist entity, which is apparently what you have to support if you're a good Jew, which is insane. So I do think finally that I, I have thought for a while that the I guess I'm, even I am shocked to some extent by the extent of the violence. And let me just say finally that this is the biggest displacement and greatest number of Palestinians killed ever, far more than 1948, far more. We are in that kind of paradigm moment. And... I mean, you know, as a journalist, I'm not, you know, I try not to be lost for words, but what does one say to that? 48, we're still dealing with 48 now, 80 years on. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And also the fact that this, this genocide is really the first viral genocide, right? Social media, TV genocide, um, you know, Israeli soldiers adv advertising their war crimes on TikTok. Yeah. Um, some of the things, you know, because we're seeing it live, we're seeing it on a, some of the things that have occurred in the last four months are so horrifying that you're saying like, we, you know, you can't be lost for words, but, but we all are. Like, you know, you know, we know how bad Israel can get, you know, because we've experienced Operation Cast Lead and, and other and other you know terrible massacres, massacres. But but this one, when you see, you know the ambulance, you know Hind being killed, the guy, you know, the, it, it's 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 actually madness to a scale that I would have never imagined. You know, shooting a car full of people, then the ambulance comes to save them, and you shoot the ambulance. And he also shows and, and talks about the level of impunity. You know, when a, a bully at school, you know, can hit people all the time and no one says anything, the bully becomes like this monster. And Israel has become this yes. monster. 
I mean, it's um, it's become a it's become a rogue state. Yeah, and yeah, it has become a rogue yeah. state. And uh, yeah, go on. I was going to say this one brief thing on that. You know, there's so much Western obsession though with Netanyahu, which I have a real yeah. problem with. Oh, that's so and important. This is not. Yeah. This is, so obviously, he's not that I'm a fan of Netanyahu. Obviously, I'm not. But the problem in Israel is not Netanyahu. Yes, he's a prime minister and the responsibility is his, of course. This is not to take away his profound responsibility for what's happened over many, many years. But all the likely alternatives appeared, Gantz, on the key issues, as you would know, there is no difference. There's no difference. On the occupation, on Gaza, yes, they would have maybe a slightly less far-right coalition, okay, sure, Ben Gavir and Smotrich probably wouldn't be in the government. Okay, that's something, I guess. But as I've been saying for a number of months, Israeli society has been radicalised. This is the issue for years, long before October 7. They themselves, talking about Israeli Jewish society, not everyone, you and I both know Israeli Jews who are doing courageous work, but they are sadly a tiny minority. I mean, that's a crucial point because now the, the new spin and everyone is ad adopting it is like, let's get rid of the Netanyahu and yes. everything will be fine. Let's talk about two state solution and everything will be fine, which is, again, madness when you've been following this, this issue for, for years. Because you know that from Ben Gurion onwards, Gaza would have happened. Maybe in a slightly different way, but what's happening now would have happened with Ehud Barak, with Ehud Olmert, with the 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 dove it's like rabin you know uh but that's it's that's what i get I yeah yeah of course I, I should <laughs> yeah yeah but th that was implied but anyway um uh that's what i get from people that you know talk to me not like the pro justice pro palestine one saying like yeah i hate netanyahu too you know i think he should go and i, I keep telling them I mean, he's obviously a problem, but he's not the problem. Absolutely. I want to focus on, our, on our, my last two questions, on, yes. uh, because on the way forward, if there's one. You said Israel is a rogue state, pariah state. I agree. We agree. But my question is now, maybe it'll be twofold. How do we, because the job is going to be down to us. Uh, do we activists, you know, uh, uh, you know, independent journalists, how do we make sure this moment changes everything? And could some legal institutions like the ICJ help us make this moment change, change everything? Um, and maybe you can talk about some countries that have, um, like Spain, the Netherlands has been ordered to stop, you know, uh, sending F F thirty fives, I think, to 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 Israel. And an Australian, yeah, an Australian uh, guy. You must know him because he, he seems progressive. Uh, MP called uh, David Shoebridge um, asked the Albanese government to stop uh, sending weapons to Israel. So how do we make sure this moment changes everything? How do we isolate Israel? and make sure that until it respects whatever international law and gives Palestinians their rights, we just don't stop. This accountability will not come from most Western governments. It's probably obvious to say that. I think what really needs to happen, and I think there is some indication that it may happen in some states after this, when I say this is over, I guess when there's a ceasefire and there's a, cessation of violence at least temporarily hopefully permanently soon that i think so much would change if there is literally one trial of one israeli soldier or general or politician it just takes one now that hasn't happened and i know that there are a number of states uh global north and global south states that are looking into the possibility of filing criminal charges against certain Israeli soldiers and um, generals and politicians after this is over. That would be an important, at least symbolically, if nothing else, it needs to be more than that. There needs to be people, the world needs to see an Israeli soldier or general in the dock. As for that matter, there should be an American generals and soldiers and 
um, politicians after 9-11 too. But that will be a start, and I think there are a lot of nations that will do that. So in other words, those Israelis are going to be pretty wonder, wonder, should I travel to that country? Should I cross its airspace? That's the first thing. The second thing is I am hopeful and confident that BDS, boycott divestment sanction, needs to explode globally, meaning that there needs to be unprecedented pressure on artists, uh, uh, musicians, whoever it may be, to not treat Israel as a so-called normal state. Now, obviously, BDS has existed for a number of years, close to 20 years now, with a number of successes, but it needs to ramp up a hundredfold. And my sense is that because there is so much public anger in so many countries, there is a need and a there'll be a desire and a space for people who want to do something to put their energy into that. There needs to be a lot more. This needs to be an election issue. At the moment, Israel-Palestine is mostly not an election issue in most Western countries. I think come November in America, this is going to be an election issue. Now, obviously, the choice is between a senile old fool and a racist bigot in Trump. So the choices are, frankly, horrible. I mean, the two main options, I mean. But as people will be well aware, there is profound anger in many parts of the American community, Muslim Arab communities especially, who are saying, we will not vote for Biden regardless of what he does now. We're done. Now that that sort of, now is that going to still last come November? We'll have to wait and see. That needs to be worked on because people like him, Biden, need to pay a price, a profound political price for that. I think finally there needs to be and again, this is starting to be talked about, that case in the Netherlands. It was actually um, uh, the Netherlands has been sending parts for the F-35 fighter jet. There are a number of other countries, including my country, Australia, which has been also sending parts to Israel. There needs to be a essentially a military embargo, frankly. And that's not going to come from Washington next week, but that can start coming from other nations. They could start, and I call this, but this is where the challenge lies. Because Israel has spent so many years selling so much, so many weapons and spyware to so many states, including many, I might add, in the global south that speak openly about supporting Palestine, that link needs to be broken. And that's going to require activists and others in those countries to put massive pressure on their governments. It's not simply enough for leader X in, I don't know, Colombia or Bolivia to say, we support Palestine. I mean, that's that's great, but it's not nearly enough. How many of those states have been buying Israeli weapons? Colombia certainly has over many, many years. Um, I think that's part of it. Finally, finally, there needs to be, which I think is already happening, there is a real need to continue to support and build that Jewish dissent or, or critical Jewish voices that the only, the loudest Jewish voices can no longer be just the apex in the US, the apex, even J Street, the sort of nominally more left-ish wing, but actually they're liberal Zionists who have mostly supported the war in Gaza anyway. This is not going to do anymore. I think generationally speaking, many young Jews do not accept that. That needs to be built, and it is being built to have political power. There are other things too, but that's just some of them. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I um, yeah, I agree, obviously, with everything you've said. Um, I do feel um, maybe that's the sort of op optimi optimistic um me uh, that we could be on the verge of a defining moment uh, but i remember thinking the same in 20 uh, in 2009 after operation gas led but i think this this one has you know they've gone really really too far you know over the top as someone uh, someone uh, as our uh, senior president said yes yeah so um 
Yeah, thanks. And I mean, something you talked about, you know, and, uh, like arms embargo on Israel, people have to realize that it's not just you and I saying that. It's actually the law and, and there's contracts, you know, when they do trade agreements with Israel, the EU yes. has got trade agreements with Israel that specify human rights are crucial. If, if one of the part, party violates human rights, this trade agreement could, you know, should stop. So stop it. You know, it's, what we're saying is just very simple. Just apply the law, uh, you know, respect your contracts and, yeah. and, but yeah. I mean, kind of saying it on that just very briefly. So a few days ago, Joseph Borrell, who's, you know, the EU yeah. foreign affairs chief, maybe, maybe you're referring to that, sort of said, oh, why are countries still selling weapons to Israel? I'm thinking, did any journalist then say, mate, most of the EU is yeah, sending yeah. weapons to Israel? Now, I guess he would know that, but I heard that and I thought, okay, take that to the next point. I mean, like this this is the empty rhetoric, which is so pointless. Yeah. yeah. We know that the weapons shouldn't be being sold, but your mates and colleagues in Berlin or elsewhere are not listening. Yeah. yeah. And for the EU, EU is Israel's biggest training partner. That yeah. doesn't change. Um, I mean, can I say one last, last thing? And this is not by any means to support our dear friend Joe Biden, but what Biden in a small, far too insignificant way, this sanctioning of four settlers yeah, from yeah. the West Bank who were violent. And this is not to, at all to celebrate Joe Biden, I can assure you. That has the possibility in many countries to massively expand. Yeah. If you start having a situation where huge amounts of politicians, settler leaders, settler X can't, can't travel to Greece and have a holiday, I guarantee you, that is where things start to change, paying a price for no accountability. So if, if, if Israeli settler X can't go to Crete for his summer holiday, trust me, things would start to change. That's what countries in the EU could do. Yeah. What, what the US is doing at the moment is very, very, very small, but that has to be hugely expanded. Make them pay a price. Exactly, yeah. The end of impunity, right? I mean, no beginning. one should be impugned of like criminal actions. And Absolutely. by the way, I don't know if you, I don't know if you heard, but France just did the same against twenty-one settlers. I think two days ago or something. And the, it's and very the, small, the UK, but yes, yeah. and the UK has done that similarly as well. I think. I think. Mm. I mean, as usual, the US kind of leads the way, so to speak. I think. Yeah. That we, that there should be pressure on countries to do a lot more on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hey, thanks, mate. Uh, thanks a bunch. It was Frank. great uh, seeing you again. And, um, and uh, yeah, um, you know, stay strong. You too. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Bye, mate.